It would hurt so bad that somebody would do something like this. Hammond Avenue in Fresno. Get in there! He's doing something to the kids! Suspect appears as terrifying as the crime. This is terrible. Marcus Wesson will be charged with nine counts of Penal Code Section 187. Regarding the, the belief that maybe there was a cult in terms of the caskets, we don't know what the intent was. Everything goes, well, Mom, was he a vampire? He called to me, I'm the oldest son. They all left him. They played with him almost every day. He's the best guy ever ever had. He was God. That's, that's, that's just the way it was. I truly believed he was God until I was 19. Why do you think you believed him so wholeheartedly? I guess because he paid attention to me. He wrote his own Bible. He wrote his own Bible? Yeah, and it did not get published. Jesus Christ was a vampire? Yeah, that was his theory, because oh, he man. shed his blood for us, so therefore we need his blood to be saved. And in his mind, it was like, Jesus Christ is the real vampire. We were like really brainwashed into believing that God would come in the year 2000. And when he did not, you know, we're like sort of justifying Okay, he's a little late. Like the false prophets before him, Marcus Wesson's mind games will lead his family toward a bloody end. Hi, guys. Welcome to my YouTube channel. I do want to thank you guys and thank my subscribers, old and new. I know it's been a while since I said that. I'm sorry, uh, but thank you. So today's episode is hella weird. It is both terrifying and bizarre and the craziest thing about it is that most of it happened in complete secrecy. For decades, Marcus Wesson's depraved world remained hidden from prying eyes. His neighbors didn't know, his family members didn't know. It wasn't until March 12th, 2004 that everyone would find out what was going on in that house in Fresno, California. So what happened that day is that two of Marcus's nieces came to his house. Their names were Ruby and Sophina. They had previously run away from his house, but they came back to get their kids. You see, uh, their kid's father was their uncle Marcus. Yeah, and that wasn't even the worst of it. So Sophina and Ruby show up to the house with like 15 of their family members. They go up and they're like knocking on the door and they're saying, we want our kids back. According to witness accounts, Ruby Sanchez and Sophina Solario pulled up to the Wesson house around 2 p.m. on March 12th, accompanied by several carloads of young people. I came to get my son, Solario said, rushing into the house to find seven-year-old Jonathan. She had the boy by the hand and was walking out of the house when her sister Rosa snatched him away and stuck him in the back bedroom with other children. According to the Fresno Bee, Solario would never see her son again. So what ended up happening is that this, they snatched the boy away from her and they pushed her out of the house. And then Marcus, who is, by the way, very tall and 300 pounds, he stood in the doorway blocking it while the nieces and their family members are outside yelling, trying to get the kids back. Then his daughter, Sabrina, comes out yelling. She says, quote, uh, Judas, Judas. And then she points to her father, Marcus's feet, and she tells them, bow down to your master. And then she takes the kids that are remaining and she rushes them into the back room where there were already other kids that had gone in. And so now there are two daughters of Marcus and a bunch of kids in this back room. Throughout all of this, Marcus is said to be unusually calm. He was like super calm and this would factor in later when police come because that's what happened, right? They ended up calling the cops because they were not able to get in and get their kids. So the nieces called the cops and it was a custody dispute. So when police came, they were looking at it as a custody dispute and they were noticing that the daughters were screaming, the nieces were screaming, but Marcus was really calm and he was talking to them and he was like wanting to cooperate with them. So they didn't go into the house. They were still talking to him. And then all of a sudden, Marcus is like, I'm gonna say goodbye to the kids and turns around, walks into the house and shuts the door behind him. 
When Marcus went back inside the house, immediately Ruby and Sofina started screaming, he's gonna hurt the kids. Get in there, he's doing something to the kids. Now what happens after this, people aren't really sure because we have conflicting reports. According to police, they surrounded the home, they didn't have enough cause to go in, it was still a custody dispute, and they didn't feel like anyone was in danger because Marcus was calm. They did say they heard babies crying when they were talking to him at the door. They also said that the son had told them that he had a gun and so they called the SWAT team to come in. So while the SWAT team was coming, they were like securing the area, they were telling people to hide or go back in their homes and people were upset like go in there, go in there, but they didn't go in there and a lot of time elapsed, like 80 minutes. During this 80 minutes that the police were outside, there's conflicting reports as to whether or not gunshots were heard. The police ordered the crowd to disperse and take cover themselves behind the bus and trees. An enraged woman punched the hood of a patrol car, denting it. During the ensuing standoff, several witnesses reported hearing gunshots inside the house, according to media reports. But all the officers present denied hearing gunshots, an assertion that was fully supported by their police chief. The Fresno Bee interviewed several neighbors who contradicted the official account. Maria Leva, who lived a few houses down from the family, said she heard four gunshots as she was emailing her sisters shortly after 3.30 p.m. Keep in mind, police arrived on scene at 2.30. She ran to the doorway and heard women screaming, not my babies, not my babies, before returning to her computer to quickly finish her message. Quote, there's been a shooting here in front, and apparently there are deaths, she wrote in a missive she showed to the paper. Wesson's next-door neighbor was in her front yard when she heard a succession of loud explosions, but told the paper that she wasn't sure what the noise was. She'd never heard gunfire before. Nonetheless, she said the words of one woman were unmistakable when her anguished cry rose above the commotion. Quote, it wasn't supposed to happen this way, end quote. If there were, in fact, gunshots and police didn't go in, obviously that's really bad because when we find out what happened, it's very upsetting if this could have been avoided. But I'm not sure. These are the conflicting uh, accounts of the noises. What we do know is that they never barged in. What ended up happening is that eventually, as SWAT was arriving, Marcus Wesson like emerges suddenly out of the house and he's like got this blank stare on his face, hands up and blood on his clothes. Once the police see that he has blood on his clothes, that's when they finally enter the home. But it was way too late. So there's an officer, Officer Escarino. Keep your hands where I can see them. I dropped my shotgun for a second. This was not the man you expected to see at the door. There was nothing I expected. He's a veteran officer. Why did I say veteran like that? He's a veteran officer with the Fresno police, and he was the first person to go in there, and he lost it. He lost his shit when he saw what happened. So this is, this is how it went down. So he says he goes into the house, and it's like completely dark, and he's creeping down the hallway. It's dark, and he's calling for the kids like, come out, it's safe, come out, it's safe. Nothing. Nobody's coming out, nothing. And then he goes to that back bedroom, the one where the kids and the eldest sisters were seen going into. There. He goes there. And when he goes in there, the first thing he notices is coffins stacked up against the wall. And he's trying to make sense of what that is. It's dark, his eyes are adjusting, and then he sees this like mass in the middle of the room. He runs over there and he realizes it's a pile of people. And so he's like frantically grabbing them, their arms, trying to like feel for a pulse and feel for a pulse and checking, 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 and nothing, nothing, nothing. And this is when he loses it. He starts screaming and crying. They had to pull him away. He said, quote, I broke down and started crying. I was trying to wipe away the tears, but the father in me was just overwhelmed at that point. And I mean, can you imagine? I, can, I, because what was there was nine of Marcus's children. It was Sabrina, 
25 years old, the one that was yelling, saying, bow down to your master. Then there was Elizabeth, Lizzie, 17, Illabel, 8, Jonathan and Aviv, both 7, Ethan, 4, Marshi, Sedona, and Jeva that are all less than 2 years old. And so no wonder he broke down and started freaking out because it was like a bunch of kids. And then they found out that it was like kind of ritualistic in the sense that they were all killed the same way. They all were shot like in the eye, like on one eye in specific. It was very weird. So needless to say, they were like, what the hell is going on in this house? It's basically like the worst thing that ever happened in Fresno. And for you to understand how we get to that day on March 12th, you need to go back to Marcus's childhood because, as you would expect, he had a fucked up childhood. So Marcus was born in Kansas in the 40s and his dad was basically a pervert. His dad was a pervert. Basically, he would, he didn't work, so he was a drunk and he would be drinking at home, quote, flirting with his kids. And um, then there were rumors that he was actually gay. I'll read you the quote. It says, he ran off with a teenage male relative to San Jose before returning to his wife and family a decade later, and a childhood acquaintance of the family would later testify that the senior Wesson once paid him $50 as a boy to submit to oral blank. So that, that was his dad. His mother, on the other hand, was a Bible thumper, and she was extremely religious and very strict. Marcus Wesson's mother, Carrie, was a Seventh-day Adventist who force-fed her children daily Bible lessons and whipped them with an electrical cord, a relative would later tell a court. As a child, Marcus Wesson's favorite game was to play preacher, a pastime he would perfect over the decades as he twisted the scriptures to his own perverse ends. He it coexisted with these two extremes, right? This mom that's espousing all these moral and strict ways of being and then this father that is deviant and not doing any of those things but yet they're you know coexisting so this would lay the foundation for his bizarre belief system that he not only created but indoctrinated with the people around him his family which is how these crazy things ended up actually taking place marcus declared himself a vampire god yes and not only was he a vampire and a god, but so was Jesus. Marcus said that Jesus was a vampire. And we'll get into like the details of it later, but essentially, you know, the whole blood of Christ and that whole thing, that was one of the reasons why he believed Jesus was a vampire. And so he had this um, weird brand of Christianity that was like vampire movies, like kind of based on that mixed with like, Christianity then mixed with like polygamy and like weird culty thing. It, it was just like a weird mix and it didn't really happen until he came back from war because another thing about Marcus is that he was actually a Vietnam vet. He was an army medic in the Vietnam War. He went there, he served and then he came back. He had an honorable discharge and that's when he became dishonorable. When he got back from Vietnam, he ended up meeting this woman. She was 13 years older than him. Her name was Rose Solario. Solario, does that sound familiar? Yes, it does. He meets Rose Solario and he moves in with her. They're living in San Jose in California. This is in the Bay Area, by the way. They have a child together. But the thing is, is that Rose already had eight children. And one of those children was Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth turned 18, eight, sorry, I wish, when she turned eight years old, she caught his eye. And he began essaying her. And then, apparently with the permission of her mother, they ended up getting married. Let, let me read you the quote, okay? He practically raised me, said Elizabeth, as a child, Marcus was in my home. My mom said he could marry me. He always told me how children should be raised. I think no matter what I had done, this would still have ended in tragedy. By 14, Elizabeth was pregnant, and by 26, she had given birth 11 times. Why do you think you believed him so wholeheartedly? I guess because he 
paid attention to me. He was 27 and she was 14. He ended up marrying her in this disgusting ceremony that they had like in the bedroom with the Bible and they put their hands on it and married each other. Now it's the 80s, right? Like the Vietnam War, that thing happened in the 60s, late 60s. In the 70s is when he goes and meets uh, Rose and then marries her daughter and that whole thing. So now it's the 80s and they've got this family where he's had kids with her and you know, they're basically homeless. They're basically homeless because although Marcus worked at a bank, for a little bit he said that God started talking to him and guess what God told him yes it's a very common thing that God tells people which is it's the end times it's always the end times right so he told her that it's the end times and that he needs to stop working also um, it, this needs to be a secret right he has this revelations and stuff this this is too sacred for people to find out so he's not gonna work He's going to, the God will provide, is what he would tell everyone, that I don't have to worry about it, God will provide. Um, and then he went on welfare. And so it was like kind of the same pathology, the family pathology that was going on with his dad and his mom, where like he was kind of doing the same thing his dad did and the same thing his mom did at the same time, but all what twisted. During this period, they end up living in squatting in various different areas. First, they lived in the Santa Cruz Mountains in the like in the mountains out of an army tent and they lived like that for a while also in santa cruz they got like some random boat and they got into that boat and they would live out of the boat that same year 1989 something happened elizabeth's sister dropped off seven of her children her sister had a drug habit and couldn't take care of them so she drops these bo boys and girls off these are his nieces that he would also end up having children with as well as his daughters now what he did with the sons that's something different we'll talk about that later but at this point now there are 16 people in the wesson household cult family clan whatever you want to call it and they find another boat this one is bigger it's 63 feet by the fall of 2003 the family had moved onto a 63-foot tugboat in Tomales Bay, an hour north of San Francisco. The sight of the Wesson girls, dressed in long black skirts and veils, rowing their father ashore in a dinghy, turned many heads. Quote, they rowed him like they were slaves, one resident told the Mar Marin Independent Journal. I had them pegged as some sort of Jonestown cult. He had such a control over these girls that even though he didn't work he would send them to work at like fast food restaurants and stuff and they had like chances to say oh my god you know this is happening help or whatever but they never did they just looked down did their work came home and gave him the money he would take the money he would eat fast food but they were always starving there was even a journal entry by one of the daughters that said it says in a diary read in court this week one daughter, Kiani, bemoaned that they had nothing to eat but rice. I hope we make it today. I can't go any longer, she wrote a year before the massacre. So again, they ended up losing the boat because uh, police officers said that it was unsafe and they needed to uh, vacate the boat and it wasn't safe for children. So that's when they end up getting the house. The house that would be known as the House of Horrors. This is the house in Fresno and it was sold to them by a lawyer called Frank Muna. And so now they're in the house. And in this house is when the Jesus-y vampire thing really kind of spirals out of control. It started with the indoctrination. They were all homeschooled, as you would probably guess. And Marcus had written his own Bible. This Bible is writing about you know, Jesus Christ being a vampire. He believed Jesus was a vampire and he explained, he said that it's because Jesus is immortal. He was dying, he died, and then he was reborn. And the blood of Christ. And so he believes that this whole story of Jesus was like code for this vampire thing. And then they would obsessively watch vampire movies. He also gave all his kids um, that he had with his kids uh, vampire names. Like the youngest son, he named him Jeva, which is like Jesus and vampire, like Jeva. And then his own name, he changed his own name from Marcus Wesson to uh, J or G Vam Mark 
Suspire, which is so original. And so remember those coffins that I told you were stacked up in the room? Yeah, the story behind the coffins was that he goes to this place and he buys 12 coffins and the guy's like oh what do you have like a funeral home business and he's like no i want to use the wood to repair my boat and then he had his daughters like carry the coffins into the car and the owner of the store the guy who sold him the coffin said quote um those girls loaded every one of them in there it was the weirdest things he said they were dutifully carried uh into his yellow school bus and then there was another weird thing too, because not only was Marcus obsessed with vampires, he was also obsessed with David Koresh from the Branch Davidians. Remember the whole, the Waco thing? If you haven't heard of it, look it up. It's like a crazy thing that happened. Well, when this was going down, the siege between this cult and the police, and it was like very deadly, um, Marcus Wesson was glued to the television. The whole 58 day standoff they had, we would watch it every day. My dad mentioned how similar him and David Koresh were. And he would tell us how much it was like our family and how he was Christ and he really admired him. He was just in love with the guy. He had multiple wives, you know, the same thing, you know, the charisma. It says here, this is how the world is attacking God's people, Wesson told his family according to the fresno b this man is just like me he is making children for the lord that's what we should be doing making children for the lord it was at this point that marcus decided that he was going to start breeding with his own children remember i told you he, he wrote his own bible yeah it was called in the light of the light for the dark whatever the fuck that means. And in it, it says, quote, in incest, one produces the seed of perfection of oneself, he wrote, in In the Light of the Light for the Dark, a tome in which he described his new faith and his conviction that he and his children were vampires. Another thing that people noticed was that it seemed like all the girls were like always pregnant, like four or five at the same time. And they thought it was strange because they didn't really interact with anyone or do anything. And they always had their head down and they were dressed from head to toe in all black, no matter what the weather was. And then all of a sudden they're like all turning up pregnant, like the whole thing was weird. His niece Ruby explained that he segregated the girls from the boys because in his twisted mind, he thought that the boys were going to start being attracted to their sisters and doing stuff with their sisters and vice versa. And so he separated them and would severely punish them if they spoke to each other or interacted or anything. It's just really strange. And this is where his teaching and lessons come into play because as part of the homeschooling, he had two lessons, two curriculums for the boys and for the girls. Um, for the girls, it was loving. And the boys, it was beating. Okay, so I, I don't know which is worse. The loving curriculum is disgusting. If you want, maybe you should double tap this a few times to skip. But um, he had them do things, many things for him. And they could be from such things as just, you know, uh, washing his hair and scratching his armpits and belly to more sinister things. And he had a program. I mean, the whole thing was disgusting. It was basically like once they turned eight or nine, he would teach them um, oral. And then as they hit puberty, like 13, 14, he would then start breeding with them. And it was like he was telling them that they were surrogates for their mom. So, and, but, but then, but then, so he's, then he was ha having kids with them. And then potentially those kids, he would start having kids. I mean, the whole, it, it just would be a never ending cycle. Quote, he did it so we would be better women, testified one niece, Rosa Solario. And she would actually be very loyal to him um, during the trial. He justified these actions with, as you guessed it, Bible passages. And that was what he would do during these lessons. He would read that from the actual Bible. And he would, uh, I think it was the King James, and he would interpret it and tell them that this meant this and this meant that. And like, oh, mental gymnastics justify it to where it's like the Bible says that we should be doing this girl's thing, you know? It says here, According to the witnesses, 
Wesson said his conduct was consistent with the Bible and that Jesus was a womanizer. The family studied the Bible three times a day, with Wesson interpreting passages for the group. Among his favorites were those dealing with polygamy. God's people are becoming extinct, Sophina Solario recalled him saying, we need to preserve God's children. We need to have more children for the Lord. He married himself to several of his nieces and daughters in home ceremonies. Ortiz recalled how they stood alone in her bedroom with her hand on the Bible and his hand pressing hers and recited marriage vows. He gave each of his young wives a necklace and gold band. I mean, these are child brides at this point. Wesson fathered children with three of his nieces and two of his daughters. Outsiders were told the girls had gone to a sperm bank to be artificially inseminated. And the worst part of this whole thing was just how far the manipulation went because it got to the point where he was pitting the girls against each other to compete for his affection and encourage them to be jealous of each other. Garbage. And then were the boys' lessons, which were the beatings, right? So basically he took out all his frustrations on them and was ruthless and merciless for no reason. For example, it says, Two jurors began crying when Solario recalled how he beat her one month son, a child he fathered, until his legs bled because the infant wouldn't stop crying. When she testified that he stabbed her in the chest when she talked about leaving the family, one woman on the panel let out a surprised yell. Solario later displayed the scar on her chest for the jury. Adrian Wesson is one of Marcus's sons. Quote, he was all I knew, he said. He was my dad. He was God. I was mortally afraid of him. There were times as a child when I could not speak, when I would defecate in my pants, when I could not walk for a week because of the, be the beatings were so bad. Another son, Serafino Wesson, said, Without knowing it, we had an invisible gun to our heads. I was brainwashed. If I ever talked up to him or tried to stop anything he did, I would not be alive today. He said he once sneaked a spoonful of peanut butter and received a beating with a cable wire that lasted for almost 20 minutes straight. Some other punishments would last for weeks or even months. Quote, a 30-day punishment involved, well, 21 hits on your person, and then that's the one in the morning, and then the one in the afternoon, and one before you go to bed, said Serafino Wesson. Now imagine getting that for 30 days straight. Now, despite all of these beatings and crazy things that were going on in the house, some of the neighbors said that they didn't even know they were kids in the house until the day the incident happened. And this is like super bizarre. Okay, it says, several neighbors commented on strange odors that emanated from the backyard almost every night. The Wesson family seemed to have nightly barbecues. At least twice a week when they were barbecuing, there would be an odor, said Barbara who lives next door to the Wesson house, it would kill you to smell it. It would gag me. Whatever he was cooking, it was not food. If it was food, they must have used strange spices. What could that be? At this time, it seems like Marcus has total control of the situation, except he doesn't. Two things are happening that are gonna to lead to this horrific day. First, he's falling behind on his payments and there's like a zoning issue going on. He has this big yellow school bus that he parks in front of the house that's like not supposed to be there because it's too long and shouldn't be parked there. And then the home is actually zoned for commercial use. They shouldn't be living in there, but they're using it for residential. So two things are happening, right? He's slowly losing grip of the home and he's also slowly losing grip of the older children because the nieces that are getting older are rebelling and running away and those two nieces remember the ones that i told you had come back after running away well they had run away by this point and now he's about to lose the house so the lawyer that sold him the home he decides to sue marcus and during this lawsuit process, they're still communicating, but he's noticing Marcus is deteriorating. 
While Wesson was always polite, even when the dispute went to litigation, his behavior grew more bizarre and his appearance became more disheveled, Muna said. Quote, a lot of what he was saying wasn't relevant to what we were discussing, Muna said. He grew that one big, long, nasty dreadlock, he said. Now, here is an interesting coincidence, and I don't know if it's a coincidence, you tell me, but the zoning issue was supposed to be resolved by March 12th, the very day the incident took place. So people are think thinking like, could it be that he knew he was going to lose the house because he hadn't taken care of the zoning issue. That day, the bus was still outside. They were still living in the house. They hadn't taken care of the issue. And they were either supposed to do that or leave. So they were already at, li at risk of being kicked out that day. And that's why the nieces came that day because they heard that he was planning to move back to Washington where his parents were, and he was gonna take everyone there. And so they freaked out, like he's taking the kids to Washington out of state, like we need to go and get the kids now. And they knew that that was the day that this was all gonna happen. So it's like, was this all planned or did this just happen to be the day? I don't know. The nieces knew, Ruby and Sophina knew, and had trained for a pact that they all made. And that was a pact that if police or child services or any type of authorities were going to come to the house and separate them and do something, that that was like the worst thing that could happen. He even trained them and taught them that the devil was a man in a blue uniform with a badge, like a cop. Like he trained them to think that like the cops were the devil. So they had made a pact and had trained for it that if this were to happen, they were all supposed to like t take each other out and everybody was supposed to die except for who? Marcus, yeah, Marcus was not supposed to die as part of this pact. He was supposed to survive and explain to everyone what happened and that this was all done for who? The Lord, always for the Lord. And then came that fateful date, right? We all know what happened, I won't rehash it, but we do know something that we didn't know when it happened what Elizabeth saw. Remember Elizabeth, she had been with Marcus since she was eight, living under this twisted world. She had had so many children with him and they had had children and she was knee deep in this whole thing. And when it was first happening, the scuffle, she wasn't home. She came home and this is what she saw, quote, Elizabeth arrived at the home where police were treating the situation as an everyday custody dispute and she made her way inside. It was eerily quiet, and her hands shook as she opened the door to the back bedroom, she recalled. The room was dimly lit, but she saw Marcus kneeling, with his arm wrapped around their 17-year-old daughter, Elizabeth, or Lizzie. I saw Lizzie just looking at me, and then Marcus called my name, Elizabeth said. He said, B, her nickname, come here, as if I were in trouble. She paused with the memory. I ran. I just ran. To this day, I don't know why I ran or how I ran. To this day, I regret it. She is haunted, too, by her daughter's expression. Lizzie didn't say a word, but she looked up at me like, Mom, it's too late. She looked at me like she had given up. She said she couldn't make out any other figures in the room. Crying, Elizabeth added, because of that, because I didn't protect my children, I will never have peace. So after Elizabeth came out, Something happened, and then Marcus came out bloody, and then that's when the investigation began. And it, the investigation wasn't as clear-cut as people thought, because at first everyone was like, okay, Marcus did it. But then it was like, no, the evidence suggests maybe someone else helped him. Maybe some of the wounds were self-inflicted. Like, it was very confusing what really happened in that back bedroom. The Fresno County Coroner's Office said one of the victims might have been somehow involved in the shooting. They said the investigators were trying to determine whether the suspected killer, believed to be the father of all the victims, was helped by someone else. Chief Jerry Dyer of the Fresno Police Department declined to comment about a second killer, but said something, it's something we are keeping an open mind to. Kiani Wesson, that's his daughter, she thinks her sister... Sabrina pulled the trigger and killed her son's sister, nieces, and nephews. Quote, I think that he had her take everybody and then he took her life, said a tearful Kiani Wesson. 
and then it was time for the trial. And in this trial, things would be revealed, and you would see certain family members testifying against him and others testifying for him and they were still loyal to him and then the way he was acting was bizarre the whole trial was crazy and the thing about it is it didn't even get much attention because you had the michael jackson trial that was like getting all the attention and there was the scott peterson trial which that was huge too so this kind of got lost in the shuffle the trial was weird from the beginning they had a hard time getting jurors because they would say that they were literally terrified of being in the same room as Marcus. Then uh, they were able to start the trial and that's when his daughter took the stand. And this is his daughter Kiana and she was loyal to him till the very end. She took the stand and it says here, pressed by the prosecution, Kiani Wesson, Marcus Wesson's 27 year old daughter, and the mother of his two slain children reluctantly went over her diary. I love you, my daddy. Always know that I am deeply in love with you. I will never leave you. Oh God, it's so awful. Kiani um, protected him. So the only things she ever admitted to were things in the diary. And even when it was in the diary, she would like explain it away. Be like, oh no, that's a figure of speech. Or no, I didn't mean it like that. And she said that she is proud of the way they were raised and that she loves her father and it's not his fault what happened. And she's the one who said that she thinks Sabrina did it. Then Elizabeth Wesson took the stand. The thing that happened that upset a lot of people and made people turn against her was that she denied knowing that anything bad was happening to the kids. Quote, how can I protect them if they didn't tell me? They never told me anything. And when the girl's belly started to swell, she said she didn't ask who the fathers were. Her excuse, her own mother had 10 kids with three different men and her sister had seven children with various men. And she considered it mean and rude to ask about fathers. And the prosecutor was like, how could you not know? How could you not know? And Elizabeth was like, I didn't know, I didn't know. And she would break down crying and then they would have to take a recess for her to regain her composure. And then they would come back again and she would question her again. And it got so bad that at one point the prosecutor says, um, what did you see in the bedroom? <clears throat> and she goes, she saw, I saw my husband leaning over uh, Lizzie. And then she didn't say anything else. She goes, I just see her eyes. I just see her eyes. Elizabeth Wesson repeated dozens of times. When, <clears throat> when Gamoyan kept questioning her, she spat, why are you such a bitch? And then his niece, Solaria Safina, took the stand. Now, she is the one uh, that had come to the house to get her son back. Remember her and Ruby. Sophina also, her son was one of the ones that was taken to the back room and killed. And she, what she said was shocking because she said that she tried to get the police to help and go in there, but they didn't. Let me read you what she said. She goes, I knew that if he went into the back, he would kill the children. She begged Sergeant Jackson to go into the house, but he was on the phone and waved her away. She testified. She ran to another officer who was in his patrol car in front of the house. The officer told me there's nothing I can do, ma'am, Sofina Solario tearfully testified. When she returned to the door, Sofina Solario said one of Wesson's sons, who had been in the house, ran into her arms crying. I think dad killed Sabrina and Lizzie, he said, according to her testimony. This is where we have that confusion again of like, did Sabrina do it? Did Marcus do all of it? And the way that the evidence was is that the gun that was used was found under Sabrina and Sabrina was the last body on top of the pile and it was like stacks of and Sabrina there with it under her so was it staged under her or did she shoot herself last um, they say that the injuries were consistent with suicide so it seems like she did it but according to the prosecution it doesn't matter because it was all done under Marcus's direction and he had been training them to do this for years and he had them under his control and this was he was God they all did everything he asked for so even if they did do it Marcus is responsible that's what the prosecution had to say the defense was like no he had nothing to do with it he was trying to work it out he was calm with the officers this is all Sabrina she loves army guns and everybody says that Sabrina was always like into tactical and training and guns and all that and she was the one yelling and saying Judas and bow at the master. There were no fingerprints on the gun. However, Sabrina's DNA was on the gun 
And so that's another thing that is making people think like Sabrina did it. As for Marcus Wesson, he did not stand, uh, he didn't take the stand in his trial, but that didn't stop him from theatrics that were happening. They say, quote, Throughout much of the trial, Wesson sat quietly between his lawyers, writing continuously on a legal pad. At court breaks, he taps his fingers on the defense table as if playing a keyboard or waves them in the air like a conductor. But when the prosecutor and his wife feuded, he appeared fully engaged in the legal process. Objection, he shouted at one point. The prosecutor is angry. That was overruled. In the end, the jury was sent to deliberate. It didn't take them long. They came back guilty on all counts, death penalty. He's in San Quentin right now. Um, and <clears throat> they say that he currently is writing um, country western songs, which he sings for his visitors. Additionally, in conversations with his family that were secretly recorded, he said he felt electrical currents in his head because God had given him an angelic brain. I've never seen that, he said, except at the beginning of time, when the angels were mixing with men. That is my hella weird story for you. <clears throat> I almost didn't do this video. Anyway, that is all I have for you guys. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye!